Let me ask you guys a question. You ever look at the Nintendo Switch and wish the PlayStation Vita had some of those games? Be honest. I'm sure there's been quite a few times you saw someone playing something on their Switch and wish the Vita had a version of its own. I know I have. Well, you're in luck. I'm gonna go over some Nintendo Switch games and then give you a PlayStation Vita game I think is equivalent to it. Now, whether the PS Vita game I mentioned is better than the one on Switch is up for debate. That's entirely up to you. Everyone has their own opinions. What I'm hoping for is that after watching this video, you'll realize the PlayStation Vita can offer the same gameplay experiences found on a Nintendo Switch. I'll be covering five different genres. Fighting, first-person shooters, action, racing, and JRPGs. I'll give one example on the Switch, followed by another on the Vita. Giving a basic overview of each, listing some similarities and differences between the two as well. Before we start, here is something to keep in mind. Remote play on Vita doesn't count for this video, so no streaming PS4 games. PlayStation Vita games must be running off a physical copy or digital download. With that being said, let's begin. Alright, the first genre is fighting, and nothing can be more fitting than Dragon Ball Fighter Z on Nintendo Switch. Developed by Arc System Works and published by Bandai Namco Entertainment. It was originally released on the PS4, Xbox One, and Microsoft Windows in January of 2018. But due to its popularity and growing demand, a Nintendo Switch port was later released in September 2018. I didn't get a chance to play Dragon Ball Fighter Z on its initial release for the PS4, so I was rather excited to finally get my hands on it for the Switch. Not to sound like a traitor, but this game is flat out gorgeous. I just can't believe how true to the anime this game looks. Now, I can't make direct comparisons to the other console versions because I never got a chance to play those, but for a Switch title, it looks pretty damn good. It's almost like the developers took artwork straight from the manga and used it to animate the characters. There were times where I couldn't even distinguish the game from the actual television show. A true visual tour de force. Anyway, where was I? Ah, right. I was trying to promote the PS Vita. So, after a few hours of playing, I couldn't help but be reminded of another game available on the PlayStation Vita. Enter Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Developed by Capcom and released on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 on November 2011. The PlayStation Vita wouldn't see a port until its North American system launch in 2012. Initial response were quite positive. Many gamers were impressed with the Vita's ability to replicate the console experience, myself included. I just wish I had a better capture card, because the footage here doesn't do the visuals justice. One look at the game in action will make you fall in love with that OLED screen. I feel like I say that in every video I make now. Not to be overshadowed by the current release of Dragon Ball Fighter Z on Nintendo Switch, Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 on the PlayStation Vita shares a lot of similarities with the anime fighter. Both games include a one-on-one -on -one battle system where each player selects a team of three. Both games utilizes a tag system that allows characters to be switched in and out during combat. Each game also has some form of meter that is gained throughout the fight. But other than that, it's used the same way, with a few minor alterations here and there. Normal super moves burn off one bar, while the more devastating attacks burn off three. Combos, counters, and partner assist are included in each game. Hyper combos in one, and ultimate attacks in the other. Each game follows the same trend, and each provides a visual light show. Of course, there'll be advocates from both sides of the fence coming at me and explaining why the two games are completely different from one another. That's fine too. Leave your complaints in the comments below. If you're a fan of the Capcom and Marvel Universe, then you'll feel right at home with Ultimate MVC3 on the PS Vita. Providing great looking graphics and hidden easter eggs only longtime fans will be able to pick out. The voice work is true to the source material, and the frame rate never buckles under the intense combat. And although Fighter Z controls surprisingly well with an analog stick, nothing beats the PS Vita's directional pad when it comes to 2D fighters. Ultimate NVC3 on the PS Vita does for Marvel what Fighter Z does for the DBZ universe. Both are excellent representations of their respective franchise. So don't feel left out if you can't play Dragon Ball Fighter Z on the go. Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 on the PS Vita plays and looks just as well. The only thing missing are the DBZ characters. Next up is First Person Shooters. In the Nintendo Switch corner, we have Doom by id Software. There were many doubts as to how this could be pulled off, but Panic Button managed to do the impossible. 
delivering Doom console experience on Nintendo's portable handheld. Of course, I'm always skeptical until I see it for myself. But after spending a few hours with the game, I'd have to commend the brilliant developers down at Panic Button. I can confirm the textures have taken a hit, some more serious than others, but the game is so fast-paced you won't have time to notice. That is, unless you really stop to take notice. Some of the atmospheric lighting have been brought over from the original version, and although they don't look quite as good, they do succeed in adding that extra layer of depth and dimension. The excellent looking particle effects also have to be mentioned. The explosions are just downright beautiful, coupled with just the right amount of motion blur. And I won't lie, the game plays great as well, running at a super smooth frame rate. At least for the difficulty I was playing at. It shows that you don't need the most powerful hardware to deliver console gaming on the go. And speaking of console gaming on the go, developed by Guerrilla Cambridge and released in September 2013, Killzone Mercenary is the fifth entry in the Killzone series. I've talked about this game so much on this channel, I'm starting to sound like a broken record. I mean, what else is there left to say about Killzone Mercenary, other than it's one of the best games available on the PS Vita? The skill and expertise that went into crafting Killzone on the consoles went into making this handheld version. The developers definitely brought their A-game, and it shows the second you boot up Killzone Mercenary. Everything from the way the game runs to the beautifully designed outdoor environments just scream quality. Gone are the dark and muted tones of past Killzone games. What's here has a lot more variety. Great looking explosions and clever use of color are a plenty. Doom on the Switch should be commended for its ability to bring a first person console shooter experience to a handheld. That can't be denied. Killzone Mercenary not only excels in bringing home the same experience, but also making it an original experience at that. Although I prefer the larger screen on the Switch, there's something charming about playing Killzone Mercenary on the Vita's 5 inch screen. Whereas the UI might look cramped and cluttered in other first person shooters, Mercenary makes excellent use of the screen space available. It's the advantage of being an original game and not having to stay faithful to a console port. It's one of those games that offer a tiny glimpse at what the PlayStation Vita was truly capable of. A game so well put together, it falls right in line with a console game of the same name. Now let's talk about action. The game representing Nintendo Switch will be Bayonetta 2. One word, wow. It's like Devil May Cry, but turned up to 11. Calling this game stylish would be an understatement. Beautiful looking graphics, easy to pick up controls, and off the wall action. The developers were definitely going for a cool factor when designing these moves, and I'd have to say, they succeeded. Developed by Platinum Games and published by Nintendo. Bayonetta 2 brings back the hack and slash action of its predecessor from 2012, this time coming home to Nintendo's platform as a console exclusive. That is if you don't count the Wii U version. This game is just so cool. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. It's some of the best, if not the best gunplay I've ever seen choreographed in a video game or movie for that matter. I also love the seamless transition of cutscene to gameplay. Very impressive. Battles are crazy, boss fights are huge, and climax finishers are always fun to watch. Offering three difficulty settings, Bayonetta 2 is easy to pick up and play. Although I did find the gameplay a little mind-numbing later on in the story. Sometimes I felt like I was watching the same moves over and over again. But luckily, there was just enough thrown in every now and then to change things up. Now, if only the PlayStation Vita had a game to match. I'm pretty sure a lot of people would disagree, but I think Ninja Gaiden Sigma Plus fits the bill perfectly. Whereas Bayonetta 2 can be a little over the top, Ninja Gaiden Sigma feels a little more reserved. A prime example of less can sometimes be more. The colors more subdued, and the combat more precise. At least in my opinion. Not as easy to pick up and play, even on the easiest difficulty setting. It doesn't have the cool, stylish factor of Bayonetta, but it does have a more refined touch. Like a sharp blade requiring the steadiest of hands to wield, Ninja Gaiden Sigma Plus foregoes the flash and brings everything back down to basics. It's just you and your blade. It's action-adventure gameplay in its purest form. Pulling off a climax finisher is fun to watch, but it pales in comparison to the satisfaction you get from a flying swallow. If you want to talk about a hidden gem on PS Vita, then this is the game. Next up, we've got racing. A genre in gaming I don't quite see as much as I used to. Other than the big major releases of Gran Turismo or Forza, it's usually pretty quiet on the racing front. Of course, that's no problem for Nintendo. They've got one major racing title, and one is all they'll need. 
Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, released in April 2017, is an enhanced port of Mario Kart 8 from the Nintendo Wii U. Playing this game is almost like going through years of Nintendo history. The roster is full of iconic characters, and the tracks are taken straight from past titles we've all come to know and love. I'm sure there's gonna be a few people who disagree, but I believe that given the quality of games over the years, Nintendo characters have gotten to the point of becoming as recognizable as Disney. I mean, the whole game gives off a Disney kind of vibe, don't you think? Maybe it's just me. The graphics look great, whether it's docked or in handheld mode, and the sound design is pure Nintendo. You just can't help but smile when you hear those familiar tunes. Now, I'll be honest, it was difficult to find a PS Vita game equivalent to Nintendo's racer that had the same amount of star power. I spent days figuring out what game I could use, and at one point almost settled on Need for Speed Most Wanted. But for some reason, it just didn't feel right. It's a great game, don't get me wrong, but I wanted something a little more special. That's when it dawned on me. It was so obvious. Wipeout 2048. It's everything that Mario Kart 8 Deluxe isn't. It may not be as recognizable as Nintendo's flagship racer, but it's just as well respected within the PlayStation ecosystem. The frame rate is fast, the visuals are gorgeous, and the gameplay more intense. Racing at breakneck speed, even Mario Kart 8 Deluxe isn't able to match. Both games allow for various weapons to be used on the track, except Wipeout 2048 trades in Mario's cute cartoony power-ups for a more realistic set of arsenal. And although the track design may not be as memorable as Mario Kart's, dedicated fans will appreciate the return of some longtime favorites. One major gripe about the gameplay is the steep learning curve. It's not as easy to pick up and play as Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Instead, Wipeout 2048 requires a little more skill with a greater emphasis on track memorization. This, I feel, might turn off some gamers new to the Wipeout franchise. But I guess that's the appeal. It's for gamers who want a racer that doesn't hold their hand. A racer that kicks you down and spits in your face. This isn't your grandparents' racing game. This is Wipeout. I, I don't know. I, I heard that somewhere. And finally, we've come to JRPGs. One of my all-time favorite genres in video games, and one that I wish I had more time to play. Tales of Vesperia originally came out on the Xbox 360 back in 2008 and was met with critical acclaim. As a way to celebrate the game's 10th anniversary, a definitive edition was released, which includes upscaled graphics, exclusive content, as well as English and Japanese voice tracks. It's so nice to come across a role-playing game from days past. This is how I remember JRPGs. Slow to start and very story-driven. You get a chance to feel out the world you're placed in. A chance to run around and talk to people. A chance to let yourself get absorbed into this new magical realm. I hate the JRPGs where you run in a straight line to get to the finish. What was that game called again? You play as Yuri, a former Imperial soldier on a mission to find a Blastia core that's gone missing from your neighborhood and uh, you know what, it don't even matter. Just know that you'll be going on an epic journey, meeting up with interesting characters and venturing off into unknown territory. With its colorful anime inspired graphics, soothing melodies, and simple but engaging combat, Tales of Vesperia will definitely appeal to fans of the genre. Of course, not every console is fortunate enough to get a definitive port of Vesperia, but that doesn't mean those unlucky few can't go on an epic journey of their own. Persona 4 Golden The PS Vita's own definitive version of an already awesome JRPG. Initially released as Persona 4 on the PlayStation 2, this enhanced PS Vita port adds new features, characters, and story elements not seen in the original version. Taking on a more modern approach, you assume the role of a high school student who's just learning to fit in. After moving in with your uncle and cousin Nanoko, reports of unexplained murders have occurred around town, and it's up to you to figure out what's going on. Gameplay consists of mundane activities of a teenage student. Walking to school, taking exams, talking to friends, and going on dates with hot Japanese girls. Trust me, it's more fun than it sounds. The nightlife is where you'll do most of the fighting. Unlike Tales of Vesperia, you won't be able to freely move about. Instead, combat is your more traditional JRPG type. Each player waits their turn, unlike Vesperia where attacking, blocking, and using magic is all in real time. Awesome graphics, captivating story, and a catchy soundtrack will make it almost impossible to put this game down. 
The journey might not be as grand as the one in Tales of Vesperia, but the sense of immersion is far greater in my opinion. Taking on a sort of life simulator, you get to experience events as they happen. If you can't get your hands on Tales of Vesperia Definitive Edition, then Persona 4 Golden is an excellent alternative. See guys, you don't need a Nintendo Switch after all. These PS Vita games offer the exact gameplay experiences you'll find on the Switch. That's right, I said it. Come at me. As always, leave a like, leave a comment. Please remember to subscribe if you haven't done so already. See you in the next video. Later guys.